Our topic is, it is false that some things can be removed from the truth and God accepted. The factor of the matter is, my friends, that nothing may be removed from the truth and God accepted. The Bible is very plain about what the truth is. We know that our Lord is the foundation and the source of truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. He prayed to the Heavenly Father in John 17, verse 17, regarding the apostles, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So God's word indeed is the truth. God has given the truth. He gave it to man through the apostles and, of course, other inspired men before them. But the Lord promised them before he died on the cross, rose again and went back to heaven. In John 16, 13, he said, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. It is significant tonight to consider that Jesus Christ said that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. All truth that was needed, all truth that the Spirit brought is the all truth that we need today. We know that Jesus Christ in John 8, 32 declared that the truth shall make you free. The truth, not simply a truth or some of the truth, but the truth shall make you free. So it is the truth of God, all of it, that will make us free from sin and take us on to heaven. For anything to be removed from the truth, man will have to do it. God is not going to do it. He has given his truth. It cannot be changed. In Psalm 119, verse 89, Thy word, O Lord, is settled forever in heaven. God has settled his word forever in heaven, and he is not going to remove anything from it. So if anything is going to be taken away from the truth, it will be man that will do it. However, that's not going to change the truth, because men who seek to change the truth one day are going to meet that truth in the judgment day that they've tried to change. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And in Romans 2.16, Paul spoke of the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. God's truth will stand forever. The fact that the truth is eternal in nature means that it cannot change, regardless of what man might do with it. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, beginning at verse 23, Peter said, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Peter here, part of this passage, goes back takes us from the book of Isaiah, although he didn't have to have Isaiah's words. He was guided by the Holy Spirit, but he does quote from Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. That means that no matter what man does with the truth, even if he refuses to obey it, the word of God is going to stand forever. But now let us consider that if men remove anything from the truth, it will no longer be God's word, but it will be man's. Anything that deviates from the scriptures cannot be the word of God. When men tamper with the holy scriptures, what they come up with is not the word of God, but the word of men. Our Lord warned in Matthew 15, 9 of those who practice vain religion. He said, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And Paul said to Titus, speaking of the commandments of men, that they turn from the truth. So 
whatever men might add or take away from the truth does not result in the truth, but it turns people and precious souls away from the truth. The truth is God's word, and it is not man. It is not man's word, it is God. We know that the only one who will take away from the truth would have to be men. It cannot be God. I would like to turn this time to the book of 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter. The Thessalonian Christians became accepted of God when they received by obedience the word of God. In 1 Peter 1, verse number 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word, but also, and not in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And then in chapter 2 of First Thessalonians, and verse number 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So in receiving the truth as the word of God, in obedience to it, belief and obedience to the gospel, the Thessalonian Christians were accepted of God. They could not have been otherwise. Moreover, we note that faith comes by hearing the word of God and not by hearing only part of God's word and part of the gospel. In Romans 10, 17, Paul said, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, the apostle Peter teaches that the Holy Spirit brought the gospel down from heaven. He said, Unto whom it was revealed, and not unto themselves, referring to the old prophets, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. God's word, the truth, is the wisdom from above. But man's wisdom is the wisdom from below. Paul, speaking of the philosophies of men, said, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, 1 Corinthians 3, 19. So for anything to be added to or taken away from the truth, the foolishness of men is what results. God looks upon this as pure foolishness. And also we go to the book of Colossians and the second chapter in verse number 18. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So whenever we see the tradition of men, the philosophies of men, or the doctrines and commandments of men, we see that which is foolish in the eyes of God. And then in the next chapter of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 22, Paul speaks of the commandments and doctrines of men which all are to perish with using, with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. My friends, let us consider that one cannot obey God's wisdom and be accepted, or rather man's wisdom and be accepted of God. To remove anything from the truth would make it the commandments and doctrines of men. Man cannot follow such and have God because then he would not be abiding in the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is the truth. John said, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So God will not accept anything more or less than the pure doctrine of Christ, which is the truth. For man to remove anything from the truth would make man the judge over God's truth. We need to consider that matter. Man would be deciding what is necessary and what is not. It would be to exalt man over God. And it would involve God, the author, in a contradiction. Because God declared that all scripture is what makes man complete spiritually. 
In 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work or under all good works. So God has declared that all scripture is needed to make man what he needs to be, to make him perfect, complete in the eyes of the Lord. But yet if something may be taken away from it, that is to imply that God is false in what he said when he declared that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It implies that the Spirit guided the apostles in something that they did not need. It would imply foolishness on God's part, who sent the Spirit to guide the apostles into all truth that we have just stated in John 16, verse 13. And we note in Ephesians 6, 17 that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Holy Spirit is God's holy Word. And we need all of it because God has sent this word unto man in the person of the Holy Spirit. To remove any word from the scriptures would imply that man is smarter than the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and smarter than God himself. In Proverbs 30 in verse number 5, every word of God is pure. We note that if every God, word of God is pure, then what word is it? that we don't need. We need all of it. And also in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and verse number 13, Paul declares that the Spirit guided and inspired men in the very words they were to use. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, if it is the case that man may remove any of these words, that is to say that man does not need something that the Holy Spirit brought unto him. And, of course, we know that is false doctrine. It would be to remove a part of that which makes man righteous. In Romans 1, verse 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, and it is revealed how to make man righteous, according to Paul here in Romans 1, 17. And it is through the gospel that man learns how to become righteous, justified, and right in the sight of God. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Moreover, in Psalm 119, verse 172, David said, All thy commandments are righteousness. So if we need all of God's commandments, which are righteousness, and to make us righteous, then what right does any man have to remove anything from the commandments of God? He has none. For man to remove anything from the truth would make the inspired word of God spoken by Moses and stated by Jesus as false. Moses was one of those men referred to by Peter when he said in 2 Peter 1, verse 21, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We note that Jesus quoted that from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, in Matthew 4, 4, when he said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If it is the case that God will accept that which is removed from the word of God, then it is false to say that man will live by every word of God, because if we do not need every word of God, why did Jesus say that? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. For God to accept man's removal of any aspect of God's truth, then it would make a farce out of the Great Commission. Let's consider that. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, All power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. 
And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Now, Jesus Christ declared that all authority had been given unto him in heaven and on earth. But if man may remove anything from the truth, then all authority hasn't been given to Jesus Christ. Christ would be giving up his authority to man. Moreover, he commanded them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. If man may remove anything from the truth, then what the Lord said was not so when he said that we are to observe all things that the Lord has commanded, not just part of it, but all of it. Well, my friends, we know that we're going to believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God, over men. The Bible plainly warns against adding to or taking away from the truth of God's Word. I'd like to go to near the, the close of the Bible in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. This severe warning is given to man. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So if man adds to or takes away from God's word the truth, God will not accept that person. This certainly declares to us that God will not accept that which has been removed from the truth. The conclusion is that God will not accept any such teaching or any such person. And I'd like to go back to the book of Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, verse number two. Moses warns by inspiration of God the children of Israel. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that is, take anything away from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Then we go over to the 11th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, in the last verse, 32. And ye shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set before you this day. And then in the next chapter, chapter 12 in the last verse, chapter 12, verse 32 of Deuteronomy, What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. And now I'd like to go back over to the book of Acts in the 20th chapter. This is Paul meeting with the Ephesian elders at Miletus. And here he gives a very stirring address to them in this passage, but I want to look at two verses in the passage. Verses 26 and 27. He said, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul here states that the blood of men would not be on his head. Why? Because he did not shrink back or shun to declare unto them the whole counsel of God, all the counsel of God. The implication is that if he had failed to declare the whole counsel of God, or shrunk back from declaring any part of it, then the blood of men would be on his head. Are we going to believe the Apostle Paul or what men say? Men who seek to take away from God's truth. By implication, many want to remove repentance from God's plan. I want to look at that point here shortly. Uh, but I want, before we do that, I want to go to the book of 1 John and the fourth chapter, 1 John chapter 4. Here, John declares that it is the spirit of Antichrist to remove the doctrine of the, reincar the incarnation of Christ from the Scripture. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. 
So those who would take away the doctrine of Christ coming to this earth incarnate in the flesh have the spirit of Antichrist. Now if that would be true concerning that particular matter, why would God allow someone to remove anything else from the scriptures? This is a plainly stated doctrine in the New Testament. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14. In Matthew 1, 21 to 23, we read concerning Jesus, that he would be called Emmanuel, God with us. In 1 Timothy 3, 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But now I'd like to go over to 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. John said, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. We see then God's view of anyone who would tamper with the doctrine of Christ and with the truth itself. If one is forbidden to remove this aspect of the truth, why would he be allowed and authorized to remove anything else? Now I'd like to look at a few modern day examples of men removing or taking away from God's truth. One of these is the Lord's teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We have seen many attempts in our modern day of people trying to do this, trying to remove certain aspects of the Lord's teaching or trying to put it in the wrong context. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 46, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. But then look at verse number 9. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Men will go far and wide trying to remove that teaching from the New Covenant, the New Testament of Christ. There have been those who advance the idea that this is part of the old law, the law of Moses. It doesn't apply to us today. There are those who say, well, this scripture is only for the church. It doesn't apply to people outside the church. But the Lord said this, whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication. That word Hassan, whosoever, means anybody at all who does that and marries another commits adultery. <laughs> By implication, many want to remove repentance from God's plan of salvation. This, of course, ties into what we just talked about. They will say, well, how can you refuse to baptize any person who would come forward to be baptized, even if they admit they're living in an unscriptural marriage and refuse to get out of it? How can you have the authority to refuse to baptize them? Well, friends, let's ask this question. Can we remove faith or belief from the plan of salvation? Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. What if someone comes forward to be baptized and says, I want to be baptized, but I don't really believe on the Lord? Do we have the authority to baptize that person? Moreover, we have no more authority to baptize a person who refuses to repent. In Acts 2.38, then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if a person declares that they are not going to repent, we do not have the authority to baptize that person. Moreover, there are those who would remove the fruits of repentance from the New Testament. Paul taught that man is to repent and turn to God and do works meet or bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Now here's another example of men trying to remove things from the truth. I think about the modern version, good news for modern man. 
It has removed the blood from many passages in the New Testament. Have you ever thought about the fact that removing the blood of Christ is not good news for modern man? That's bad news for any man. Because without the blood of Christ, the precious blood of Christ, we cannot be redeemed. According to 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19. But yet, in today's English version and the good news for modern man, the word is blood is removed in Revelation 1, 5. And of course, in other places, they remove the words of God found in the truth. Revelation 1 speaks of him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, referring to Jesus Christ. We know now it's been uh, over 60 years ago, more like 70, that the translators of the Revised Standard Version, led by the infidel Dr. Harry Orlinsky, removed the word virgin from the Isaiah 17 prophecy, 7 verse 14 prophecy, of the virgin birth of our Lord. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear his son. His name shall be called Emmanuel. We know that Jesus is the fulfillment of that according to Matthew 1, 21, 23. But yet the Revised Standard Version put young woman in there. It took away from God's truth. The today's English version removes virgin from 11 of the 14 New Testament passages where it is found. For example, in Luke 1.27, they substituted the word girl for virgin. We note that there are also many translations today that mutilate the Greek word monogonais, which should properly be translated only begotten. In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My friends, we know that Jesus declared that not even a jot, that is a jot or a tittle, was to be removed from the old law till all be fulfilled, Matthew 5, 18. If that be the case, how much more of that law that came by the precious blood of Christ which Jesus said, this cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26, verse 28. Then there are those who would remove the doctrine of the one church from the truth. We have many brethren today that shy away from that topic anymore. They don't want to stand up for the Lord's one true church. The Bible teaches that the body of Christ is the church and that the church of Christ is his body, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And then later in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, there is one body. So if there is only one body, there is only one church. And Christ is the head of the body of the church, Colossians 1, verse 18. We know that Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body, Ephesians 5, verse 23. And Romans 12, verse 4 and 5 also speaks of the one body of Christ. Jesus promised to build the church, one church. In Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He did not promise to build more than one, but only one. No preacher and no congregation is sound who will not stand up for the one body of Christ, the church. They may not get up and say overtly, well, the Lord has more than one church. But many are going to be condemned by what they fail to say and what they don't say. And that's the problem today with many in the brotherhood. They are failing to stand up for all of God's truth. My friend, if you don't have the truth about the church, then it can't be the true church. We cannot be the true church without teaching the whole truth. But then there are those who would remove the doctrine of hell fire, everlasting fire, everlasting hell from the truth. When the high and holy Son of God declared that hell is eternal, in Matthew 25, 41, to the goats on the left hand, he shall say, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelation 21, verse 8. Those who would do such a thing obviously don't fear God. 
They don't respect Christ. But Jesus said, Fear not them which kill the body, but they're not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, Matthew 10, 28. No person would deny the eternality of hell fire who respects and loves Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But then there are those, and we know this came up back several years ago with the change agents and the new hermeneuticers, as we call them, those who would remove God's law of exclusion from the Bible. That may sound like a big fancy term, but it's not hard to understand. Even our children understand that principle with Noah and the ark. God commanded Noah to make the an ark of gopher wood, Genesis 6, 14. He specified the kind of wood that Noah was to make. <coughs> that excluded all other kinds of wood. That's God's law of exclusion. That's an example of it. And yet there are those today who will say, well, you have to have a commandment expressly forbidding something for it to be unauthorized. My friends, that's not true. If we do not have God's word on the matter, if we don't have his authority speaking on it, we don't have the right to do it. Back in the early days of the restoration movement in this country, people were coming out of sectarian religion and they were seeking the Bible only. They were saying, speak where the Bible speaks, and be silent where the Bible is silent. Paul said that whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. That is, by the Lord's authority, according to his word. Now here's another example of where many do not like God's law of exclusion. And that is in the matter of the music of the church. In Ephesians 5.19, Paul said, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I believe the NIV says making music. That's not a correct translation. The only music that is authorized is singing and singing alone. God does not command or exemplify in the New Testament any other, any other kind of music. When God said to sing, that excluded all other kinds of music. Again, that's God's law of exclusion, which many people do not like. Moreover, God's command to sing enjoins upon every member of the church and every Christian to sing. There's nothing in the New Testament about special singing groups and praise teams and solos, duets, quartets, triplets, or any other et. Every Christian is to sing. The reflexive pronoun in Colossians 3.16 demands it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. There it is. In Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. God demands singing only and by every Christian. As we conclude this evening, my friends, let us consider, and I love the theme of this lectureship every year, Contending for the Faith because that's a Bible theme. Jude said that we are to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. My friends, anything less than God's whole truth cannot be the faith of Jesus Christ. Thank you.